All right, so we're going to start today. Um, today's topic is on obesity. And it's a really interesting um, kind of condition that really uh, pulls together what I think uh, the, all the different systems that we've covered so far in class. So your neurological system, your gastrointestinal system, your microbiome, and your endocrine. This disorder um, and condition has all of those factors in play. And we'll talk about that, kind of the molecular controls of that um, later on in this class. But w one thing I really wanted to point out is, um, is this picture right here. So this is a picture of the Pima Indian tribe. This is a picture of the Pima Indians in about the early 1900s. And this is a picture of the Pima Indians today. And they are actually uh, what's considered a textbook case of, of why obesity is affecting the modern world. OK? And uh, so I'll show you a little clip in, in, uh, in a second. But I do want to put this in context. So these are Indians that traditionally have lived a fairly uh, sparse food lifestyle. They don't get access to a lot of food. So the traditional homeland is in southern Arizona. And what's really interesting about that is about 1,000 years ago, about a couple hundred of the Indians broke off from the main tribe, which is still in Arizona, and moved down south to here in central Mexico. So there's actually two separate communities of Pima Indians currently in, in the world today. One living in, who are American citizens who live in reservations in the areas south of Phoenix, and then one in central Mexico. They are, very, they, they are genetically um, only about 1,000 years apart, which is very short in human evolutionary time. But they are uh, two different people with two different sets of environments. And what I, what I want to show you in this video is kind of the effects of these environments on this particular tribe. You hear that? No. Hold on. Let me plug, let me plug in the audio for a second. OK. Got that? OK. Let's try that again from the beginning. And there's no audio. Hold on a sec. We try it now? No, nope, not getting anything. There it goes. No. Nope. Hmm, that's surprising. Is it, you sure that's the same right audio thing? It's that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, plug that in. Okay. Oh, uh oh. Sorry, guys, a little technical difficulties. Um, yep, that's good. And the video coming back on? It'll come. Oh, he almost had it. Oh, the gray screen of death. Is there any way to fix that? Like, can we jiggle it? Sorry, folks, technical difficulties. Take some time to look at your plates real quick. Come on, do it. Yeah, Shivani, I was impressed with your spit. A lot grew. I was really impressed. That's it. Can't the cord is not the problem. Are you sure it's the connection of the computer? All right. Hmm. All right, I think we're just going to have to skip this video, but it's very, yeah. all right. Yeah. 
Jesus. Again, sorry for the technical difficulty, folks. We're gonna try to fix this as soon as possible. better? That's much better. Okay, let's do that. Is your computer? All right. Computer sucks. All right. All right. Want to change the audio in there, too? Do you have more audio? Huh? Do you have more audio? What do you mean, more audio? No, that's a bit. Okay? All right. So, guys... We'll do this real quick. And why is this not? There it goes. OK. OK. Today, the Arizona Pima share the American culture, the American lifestyle, and the American diet. But in one important respect, they've outdone their fellow Americans. They are now the fattest population group in the fattest country on earth. Like a fast country. I earth. have uh, 1245, 145, and 245 deaths on the 11th. In this state of the art hospital, the Pima cope with diseases that doctors have linked to obesity hypertension, high blood pressure, several forms of cancer, bone, joint, and muscle strains, sleep apnea, and diabetes. A staggering 60% of Pima adults are diabetic. High in the Sierra Madre Mountains of northern Mexico, there's another Pima community of just 700 people whose ancestors separated from the main tribe and migrated here nearly a thousand years ago. These Pima of the Sierra Madre are, on average, 60 pounds lighter than their American cousins. Diabetes and obesity are virtually unknown here. The only thing that distinguishes the two groups is lifestyle. The Mexican Pima farm and live as their ancestors did. There are no labor-saving devices here, not even electricity or pipe water. You walk, you ride, and if you're late for school like Maria Rande Cedro, you run all the way, three miles. Imagine doing that every day. The Mexican Pima spend 22 hours a week in hard physical exercise. In Arizona, the figure is less than two. And here they eat a traditional diet of fruit, vegetables, and corn tortillas, high in fiber and low in animal fat. For scientists, the striking physical difference between the two branches of the Pima nation perfectly illustrates the impact of modern living on weight and health. Okay, so I wanted to show that video because it's actually a really good point that this video makes, that genetically, we as human beings um, are not built for the modern world that we live in, okay? We are genetically designed as hunter-gatherers who live in environments where we have very few sources of food. So when we find food, we are trained to gorge, we are um, conditioned and environmentally adapted to be really good at storing fat and storing energy. Because we don't know, environmentally speaking, evolutionary speaking, when we're going to get another source of food. Right? The modern world doesn't have that problem. In fact, we have the exact opposite problem, where there's food available all the time. So it's our evolutionary histories meeting this modern reality, which our bodies aren't designed to really cope with. The Pima are great, are probably the most the best kind of genetic example of that. 
they, again, live in a very, historically speaking, genetically uh, food sparse environment. And their bodies are very well genetically adapted via nat natural selection over time to basically be really good at storing fat. Right? Because they, again, look, look at their historical environment. Not a lot of fat, not a lot of energy uh, food sources. Put them in the modern world, put them with modern conveniences, put them with modern food. They get really good at that. All right? So they're, really, they're an extreme outlier, and this is why this, these populations in Arizona and central Mexico make for a really fascinating scientific study. But it's kind of a, it speaks to what's actually happening with uh, human beings in general. We are not designed for the modern uh, food environment that we currently live in. Right? So it, it falls on us to be conscious of that. I just want to drive that point home. So I basically first off want to talk about the obesity, of the epidemiology of the problem. As bioengineers, when you go out into the real world, this is probably going to be one of the biggest health challenges you will face if you would decide to pursue anything in the health sphere. A lot of opportunity here, lots of problems here. All right. I also want to talk about the medical definition of obesity. It's actually a really interesting topic that's currently under debate at this point. And we'll talk about a bit about molecular control, the difference between the homeostatic and the hedonistic systems of control for appetite and, uh, and food consumption, and talk about the current treatment, what's out there for, uh, for treating obesity. Okay? There are currently probably uh, as many, if not more, overweight and obese people in the world than there are malnourished people in the world. We've actually passed that tipping point sometime in the, in the 2000s. All right. Very interesting thought about that. Over 1 billion people in the world are over, overweight. The figure for malnourished is probably under that, probably about 800, 900, 000, 900 million. Over 300 million obese. And the United States is, again, one of the fattest countries of the world. According to that video, we're number one. We're actually number two nowadays. Saudi Arabia is number one. But not sh actually, I think it's Mexico. I'm sorry. Mexico. My apologies. Mexico is number one. But we shouldn't. It's not like we're congratulating ourselves or patting ourselves on the back for that, all right? Um, in the United States, again, a third of the population is overweight, a third of the population is obese, and a third of the population is normal, all right, generally speaking. Now, you guys live in a Stanf Stanford, it's a college environment, a lot of young people. You tend to probably not see that reflected in the college population. But in, in, in the population of the general population in the United States, this is actually very true. And this is actually a very disturbing fact. A third of children worldwide are overweight. Okay? That's not good, because if, you, if you're overweight and as a child, your odds of being overweight or obese as an adult really multiply. All right, so we're, that's something you ought to think about. So like, this is a, not only a serious problem now, this poses to be a serious problem going forward into the future. Yes, Savani? Ah, uh, the. Yes, so it's actually, I'll talk about that when I define obesity. It's actually, actually a medical definition. And we'll talk about it in a second. All right? Obesity itself is a problem because it lends, it basically is the root cause for a lot of these other things. All right? Arthritis, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, strokes, hypertension. All of that is related to obesity. And what the heck is going on? Yes, yes. So sometimes it's a cause, sometimes it's a correlation. And, and it depends on the really, really depends on the person. Right? Also increases your chances of getting cancer as well. Right? And if you're obese, you, you, you are more likely to die than obviously if you're not. Right? So what's the cause of this kind of growing uh, population of people who are going to be obese or overweight in the future? And you know, why are people, are, uh, generally speaking, obese and overweight now? Well, a lot of it is that we're getting wealthier, all right? Um, this is an example of the kind of Chinese intern, uh, I use China as an example here because it's actually a very extreme outlier of this. But it's about the inc income distribution of China in the last 30, 40 years, right? You can see, actually, the poorest uh, quarter of Chinese people today are as rich as the richest quarter of Chinese people in the 70s, right? Extreme outlier, but very much true. Um, the developing world is getting richer. That's actually a good thing. It, it bodes well for global health. It means that like basic 
diseases that affect poor populations are being reduced. All right? So that's a good thing, but what's happening is that you know, if you're curing malaria, if you're um, solving malnutrition, these other problems of the Western world kind of come into focus. So things like cancer and, and obesity become bigger problems because you're, you're, you're curing or solving these more basic uh, problems of, that are more associated historically with, with uh, uh, lower income. Yes? So cancer, cancer is a, is a problem of basically you're solving all these other all the other problems, and then you'll because cancer is going to affect you eventually. Obesity actually um, increases that risk because you have more cells in your body. More cells means more chances of mutation over time, and that's what why uh, obesity increases cancer risk. Okay. So okay, more wealth. What does that mean? Well, more wealth is generally correlated with more meat consumption. Okay. So this is a kind of a. Uh, a chart of per capita meat consumption on the y-axis and income on the x-axis of all the countries in the world. You can see that it generally follows this curve. The richer you are as a country, the more meat you consume. Yes? Meat in general. Meat in general. Now, there's outliers, right? Japan's historically a very low meat-consuming society. Uh, Brazil is very traditionally very high. We are also outliers on the list, generally speaking. Right? But this is generally true. The wealthier you are, you are uh, as, a, as a society, the more meat you're going to want to consume. All right? And also, this also lead, uh, leads into other food consumption uh, changes over time. So here is a list of uh, various things that people consume and changes over time of that consumption in, from 1963 to 2003. All right? You can see percentages of change of consumption of meat. We have developing countries here, industrial countries, and China. China is a great outlier of that because it's actually a developing country that's really rapidly developed. So you can see over four decades, developing countries and China and increase a lot in meat consumption. They increase a lot in sugar consumption. They decrease in vegetable, green, green vegetable consumption, and decrease in roots and tuber con consumption. They increase in vegetable oil consumption and increase in grain consumption. So you're talking about a shift in diet. Less fruits and vegetables, more meat, fats, and sugars. All right, that's going to directly uh, correlate to increases in obesity over time. Yes? We are more inclined for survival purposes to have foods that have um, high nutritional content and like dense nutritional content. So meat is a really great source of that. You have to eat a lot more in fruits and vegetables to get the same kind of nutritional content that you would for a smaller amount of meat. Right? So think about the time that you as a human being will spend eating. To put it in comparison, something, some, uh, an animal like a panda, they eat bamboo. They spend over 60% of their time eating food in order to get their nutritional content. So we, as omnivores who eat meat, will spend less time um, eating food. And that's actually like a, to our evolutionary benefit. Yes, Maddie? Well, this is, yeah, this is also a societal thing where um, as the economy of a, of a society uh, grows, the um, availability of food becomes greater, so the prices of food tend to drop. So you think about how much um, the average American, for example, spends on food today versus the amount they spent in like the 50s and 60s. As far as proportion of income, we spend less on food today than we do than we did in the 50s and 60s because the society's gotten wealthier and the food availability has gotten greater. So the prices have basically either stabilized or dropped for most foods. Okay. Especially processed foods. Especially processed foods. Well, I'm not here to debate the ethics of that. Okay. Yes. All right. But but generally speaking, the world in general is getting heavier. So this is a, a graph of various countries. You can see that over the last 30 years or so. This rates of obesity and rates of, um, of, uh, of being overweight have increased for both ma male and female populations. Okay. So I want to go backtrack and then really ask, how do you really define obesity? What's the medical term? What's the medical definition? All right. So the current medical definition 
is based on body mass index. This is what doctors currently use. If you go to the office for a physical, right, they take your weight, they take your height, convert that to kilograms and meters, and do this equation. Kilograms divided by meters squared. And the number they put, get out basically tells you what category you're in. Okay? So I'm not sure how many of you have ever gotten a physical from a doctor and actually had your BMIs calculated. Anybody? Hmm? All right, so you kind of generally know, right? So the medical definition is anything under 18.5 is considered underweight. If you're overweight, you're in this category, 20 to, 20 to 30, generally speaking. Anything over 30 is considered obese. And anything, and there's categories of obeseness. So you can be severely obese, and then there's more morbidly obese. Anything, anybody who has a BMI of over 40 is considered morbidly obese. That, that, that's really strongly correlated with a lot of health problems. Now, there's a, this is what doctors have been using for the, since basically, I think, the 50s and 60s, for a long time to calculate overall like how you medically define obesity. Yes, John. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't actually know. Um, James, do you know? So again, this is what uh, doctors have been using medically to describe, to describe people's weight and your body type for decades. There's a, think about the flaw in this, though. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Think about the flaw in this, right? So, so this is a great example, OK? Same two people. These two people, obviously very different, right? They're both, however, 6 foot and 250 pounds. They're both considered obese. A little weird there, right? So think about this. So I'll give you a great example. Um, Andrew Luck, you guys probably know him, right? His BMI is probably between 25 and 30. He's considered overweight. I think as a professional quarterback, do you think he's overweight? LeBron James, he's considered overweight, right? So like what you, the majority of people who, who you know as athletes, professional athletes who are you know, famous, they're considered overweight or obese, generally speaking. And this is because there's a, there's a common, uh, there's a kind of flaw in the BMI system. The fact that actually muscle is seven times as dense as fat. So think about that. You could have the same amount of mass and muscle and, and fat, and you could be really lean, right? But you're going to be as heavy as a guy who's seven times your size, generally, of, uh, well, seven times your size of fat, via fat versus muscle, right? That's obviously a huge flaw. Yes, Maya. Actually, we'll talk about that in a second. So yes, so they're actually, so the current, yes, we're going to move right to that. You're, you're just anticipating me perfectly. All right, so the current way is BMI. Doctors do that right now. It obviously has its flaws, right? So what are some other ways that people are, are proposing, like this is the way we really should be measuring um, for obesity and health risk, all right? So one of them is, yes, is uh, waist, waist circumference, right? It's historically known that pair, uh, pair fat, so fat at the hips and the buttocks, is actually less, uh, un is better for you than apple fat, so ap a fat around the core, all right? And they actually had done medical studies and say, OK, if you just measure waist circumference, if you have a lower waist circumference, you have a lower prevalence of a lot of health indicators, a lot, a lot of medical problems. So you have lower risk of diabetes, lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower risk of hypertension. And if you have, again, higher waist circumference, you have a higher risk of each of those things. All right, so that's one way to measure it. That's probably better than BMI. Okay? And so here's some recommended guidelines for that. Waist chart for men and women. You can take a look at this in, in your lecture slides. Another one, which is a little more refined, is actually waist to hip ratio. Okay? So I obviously circumference to your waist divided by circumference to your hip. You get a ratio. And this is actually, they've done studies on this, and they, this is actually much better cor correlated even than just waist circumference itself with prevalence of diseases. All right, so in this chart, you have um, on the x-axis, your a person with average um, waist hip ratios or average BMI or average waist circumference, and then one and two standard deviations away. And how that's correlated with health, uh, hazard risk, health risks of cardiovascular disease, coronary disease in both men and women. Right? And you can see that the waist-to-hip ratio is actually a better predictor of 
um, of health risk than either the just the waste by itself or the BMI, right? So here is just another chart for you guys for kind of what the ideal for low, moderate, and high uh, disease risk related to obesity, obesity of hip to waist ratio is. Now again, these are have their papers coming out that say this is a better measure than BMI. Um, it's really hard to get the medical community to kind of overturn over 50 over 50 years of just this is what we do, right? So people still measure BMI and associate it with a health with health risks related to obesity. It's not that accurate. People know it's not accurate, but people still do it, even though we know there are better measures out there. All right, so this is kind of like where people are trying to break that down right now. Like, hey, we shouldn't be using this. Hey, we should be using something else that's a better predictor. Shivani, do you have a question? The thing is, bone is not a really heavy part of you, so it, it has not that not that huge of an effect, unless you have again bone disorders. Then they would have, but like bones tend to actually be less uh, again lighter than your muscle. Okay. So muscle is your actually muscle and water are like the two biggest things that contribute to weight. Right? This is why you see like when wrestlers they need to make weight for something they'll like just lose a bunch of water. Mm -hmm. Not obviously good for you, but you can do that because you can look when you want to lose it a lot of weight quickly. It's very easy to lose water weight. Okay. Any qu other questions? All right. So move on to molecular control. Talk about two systems here: the homeostatic system, the, what's basically um, the subconscious thing that's regulating your appetite, regulating your your ability to uh, think about food, and then the hedonist, hedonistic system. This is something that you've actually that you actively control. Okay. Yes. Hmm? Mm -hmm. How easy do you think it is to measure body fat accurately? So, mm -hmm. so how do they measure it? Right, they do little flabs. How do they do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds very advanced. So how, how many, uh, so yes, you can actually very accurately measure body fat via that kind of technology. However, yeah, and as you said, a scale like that's $500. Um, think about how much most scales cost, period. Right. You can understand that like, most people don't do that or can't have access to that, right? So yes, you can accurately measure body fat just by actually uh, doing a calculation of voltage, but that's a very expensive technology. Now, if you do physical, most people will do like you know the fold check. Yeah. They'll give you that little cal caliper thing. Very inaccurate, but it's like the best cheap thing they can, they can do, right? So that's why they don't really measure. It's hard to measure total body fat. That's the problem. That the, the measurement is not trivial. Yeah. Mister, so do you have a question? How many, okay, so this is actually a good question. So you're talking about $500 for a scale. How many exam rooms exist in a hospital? How many of those do they have to buy for every single exam room? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm? All right. So, so that, that's actually very true, that you can do it in a hospital. What about a doctor's office? What about a clinic? What about some other location where you're actually taking a physical? So it, it's something like technology that you could probably get very easily in a hospital. But if you're talking about trying to do this in a rolling clinic or something that like, you know, your funds are short, it's probably harder to do. So there's a practical matter of economics here. And what's, like maybe $500 is not expensive for a hospital in the United States. Try going to India and doing that. So there's a big difference there. Yes, Maya. Again, th these are all great points, and I don't have an answer to you for some of the reasons why, but there's a lot of, you're not talking about things that are always logical, right? There's probably policy initiatives, thoughts, and, and the reasons that are against that, which I actually have no idea, all right? So yes, you, what you guys are proposing are fairly good common sense solutions to diagnosis, okay? Um, but they, 
Remember the thing about that. You have to be able to, one, make it really easy and accessible, and you have to convince people that it's something they should be doing. Like, remember the prop, remember um, for the last lecture I talked about, you know, fecal transplantation? That seems like a good solution. Think about how hard it is to convince people to do it. Right? It's probably similar to here. Like, there's inertia in one direction. Like, people have done BMI for decades, so that's what everyone knows. And trying to change that is actually very difficult because you're trying to change a societal habit. Right? Everyone, like if you look at every single health study, it's all about BMI, BMI, BMI. So trying to change that over time is going to take a lot of time, take a lot of effort, take a, basically take a societal shift. All right? And I don't have the answers for you on that, how to do that. It's something that's interesting to think about. All right, sorry, we've gone a little far in this conversation. I'm going to move on. All right, so when we're talking about uh, molecular control, it's for something like a problem like obesity, it's an interplay between these organs. Okay, you have your brain, you have your stomach, your intestine, your pancreas, and the fat itself, the adipose tissue. Okay, and you can see there's a lot of molecules involved, a lot of crosstalk. I want to focus on three particular molecules in particular because these are actually, I think, three, three of the core ones. So you have leptin here, which is produced by your fat, ghrelin, which is produced by your stomach, and insulin, which is produced by your, by your pancreas. Okay, I'm simplifying just to let you know, because of uh, time issues. You can talk about all these other things, like the vaginal efferent CCK, which was talked about in, uh, by Dr. Disaroff in the gastrointestinal lecture. I won't focus on them. If you want to know more about them, I would look them up in your own, in your own time. But I'm gonna talk about these three, okay? So first off, leptin, insulin. These are your SADI signals. These are the signals that tell you you're full. All right, so obviously, um, leptin is produced by your fat, pancreas, produces insulin, those signals go into your brain, into the hypothalamus, where they interact with a, uh, I don't know exactly the names of these neurons, I'm sure Dr. Dushroff will know, but they interact with neurons to basically um, regulate your appetite and actually regulate your, your food, food, uh, food intake. All right, so when you have high levels of insulin and leptin, you reduce food intake and you actually increase energy expenditure. You also signal to your liver, if you have high levels of insulin, to stop glucose production. Right, so you obviously you don't want to release more glucose into your blood if you already have glucose in your blood via food. Right, when you have low levels of these, obviously, um, that's also a signal. So it basically tells the neurons to increase food intake, decrease energy expenditure, and it also tells your liver to release more glucose into your blood. Okay. Ghrelin is your hunger signal. It's produced by your stomach. When your stomach's empty, it basically travels from the blood to the hypothalamus and tells you, hey, I'm hungry, I want to eat, right? And then when you eat food, the levels of blood glucose uh, will regulate the level of, of ghrelin in your stomach. Right? So eating, if you fill your stomach, your stomach stops producing ghrelin, you don't get that signal to your, to your brain, so you're not hungry after you eat, right? So insulin, and ghrelin are actually your short-term hunger and satiety signals. All right, so they control your day-to-day -day hunger and your satiety. Okay? So you can see here the chart. This is plasma ghrelin in your blood over time. And obviously, it spikes right before meals. You eat, and then it immediately drops right afterwards. Very short-term. Right? Same thing with insulin. A little different, though. Yes? This is part of the circadian rhythm. So it's re being regulated a little bit by your circadian rhythm. You wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I haven't eaten in X number of hours, I feel hungry. That's part of the circadian rhythm, yes. Insulin is similar, right, in that it spikes, but it spikes actually right after you eat. So it doesn't spike right before you eat, it spikes right after you eat, tells you I'm full for a very short ter term, and then it drops back to a level until the ghrelin signal. So it's actually telling you, oh, I'm stopping, the, uh, I'm stopping eating, and actually, I um, it's been postulated, I'm not 100% sure if it's been confirmed, that actually this spike in insulin is, is indirectly or directly regulating this drop in ghrelin. So they kind of play off each other. So they, they're known to be correlative, but they're not known which is causative. Okay. okay, so what about, I've talked about insulin, ghrelin, short-term hunger and satiety. What about leptin? Leptin's interesting because it's actually, it's all about your long-term appetite metabolism. Okay, so in a normal functioning human being, if you have weight loss, you have reduced leptin levels. 
And what reduced leptin levels do will tell you, hey, I'm starving. I don't have, your fat cells are starving, literally. So they'll tell your body to increase the food ex intake and actually decrease the energy expenditure. So your metabolism goes down, you get hungrier, and your appetite increases long term. All right? And so this is a good example of this. They literally, uh, like, this is a mouse that they've, if you um, overexpress, actually, no. Uh, this is the mouse. Forget, hold on a second. Um, if you take away the gene that produces leptin, um, it thinks it's starving all the time. So it'll actually keep on eating, 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 and overeat, and it turns into this mouse. So that's actually a disorder that can be found in humans. You can actually have um, misregulation of your leptin production, and there's actually. Uh, Lept leptin supplementation is actually the treatment for that. We'll talk about that as, as part of treatments. Yes, Elvis. Uh, Not 100 percent sure. The research into the microbiome is really young. Like you're talking less than like five years or less old. So um, if there is, it's probably new literature that is either coming out or has not come out yet. So that's a good question. I'm not, it's probably something people are currently looking into. That's actually a great question. I don't know. I know I do know the microbiome is affect does affect some of the other hormones, um, but you know, like the details of that are still fairly murky. Okay. When you have weight gain, right, you have more more fat cells. They're bigger. They produce more leptin, right, and that should tell your body, hey, I'm I have a lot of energy reserves. So you decrease food intake. So your appetite should lower. And you increase energy expenditure. Your metabolism goes up when you have more fat cells. Right? That's true for a normal, healthy, functioning human being. Right? So what happens when somebody's obese? What happens to these three particular proteins? What, 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 do, you think, what do you guys think happens? All right, so if you're, hmm? All right, you have increased insulin. What else? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Any other thoughts? So those are both correct. All right. Your insulin levels go up. Your oh, sorry. Your insulin levels go up, your leptin levels go up, your ghrelin levels go down. Right? So that's what you would expect for n natural response to getting having more fat cells, right? And having bigger fat cells. All these things should happen. Well, the problem when, when you have obesity is, is, the, is the resistance of insul to insulin and leptin. It takes more and more of those signals to get the same response as you get, as you get uh, heavier as a person. So it's this vicious cycle where for both insulin and leptin, you eat food, right? But it takes, and you make your leptin or insulin, but it takes more and more of that leptin and insulin to achieve the same signal in, um, in an, in an obese person. So like basically, your receptors become less sensitive. Your receptors become less sensitive. You start, you don't really get that kind of benefit of I'm full. It actually, that signal does not reach your brain. So you, you think your, your body thinks you're actually thin and wants to make you eat more. There's a vicious cycle. And so you think about insulin resistance, right? This is, the, this is kind of the, the cycle that leads to Adult onset diabetes, right? Yes, just this stuff. Well, so th that's the problem, right? Like you could over prescribe that, but again, you're still building up the receptor's tolerance for insulin and leptin. It's effective. It it it's not effective long term, right? Because you're still not addressing the fundamental problem that the receptors themselves are less are less uh, able to respond. So this is how, this is why it's actually really hard for um, once you become obese to actually lose the weight because you still have these unreceptive receptors who are responding to less and less of the signal. So, but then this begs the question again, how do people become fat in the first place? What's the trigger for that? Well, that's more of your hedonistic eating system, all right? So this is a system that's kind of related um, 
it's actually the same, cis, the same kind of molecular controls of people, um, and they've shown this in mice, compared to uh, drug addiction. Right, so they have these mice, and they provide them access to unlimited amounts of these things. Food, drugs, food, cocaine, or heroin. And the responses are the same. The longer they have access to these unlimited quantities of this, the more and more of those things are required to get the same response or the same reward thresholds. Right? So you have these, these, these uh, two reactions to a, a piece of food. You have, your eat it, you have your homeostatic level where if you're hungry, you should eat. But if you're not hungry, oh, I probably shouldn't eat that piece of cake. I'm full. Right? That's your um, insulin, ghrelin, leptin responses. But you also have this other res uh, uh, response, the hedonistic system. It's saying, ooh, cake, I want to eat more of that. Or ooh, cookies, or ooh, something really pleasurable to my mind, right? So it's, oh, that's going to override your homeostatic signal saying, I'm full, I probably shouldn't eat anything. It's like, oh, I really want to eat this because it's really tasty, right? And what it is is really your dopamine receptors, OK? So they've done the studies. Cocaine is effective because it blocks your dopamine transporters from being taken back up to your, uh, um, taken back up to, uh, by the precursor axon. So that's why you have, you're flooding your, your uh, uh, in-between nerve area with more dopamine. And that's what causes the response, special response to cocaine, right? Well, food's the similar way. You're not blocking anything. You just, every time you eat this pleasurable food, you're releasing more dopamine. And your body, your neurons love that, right? So it's a, it's a similar response. So that's your, your hedonistic system of reward in your brain can override your body's ability to just say, hey, I'm full. Yes, Maya. It's, it's, um, it's the same thing. Anything that gives you pleasure is going to basically go down this dopamine pathway. So it could be drugs, it could be food. Um, gamblers have the same thing. So if you have an addictive personality, you'll also tend to, tend to use this dopamine reward system in your brain. So it's your, it's your brain's dopamine system overriding all your other homeostatic controls. I think that's more of evolutionary. The reasons why, we don't know, but we do know that this has happened. Okay. And actually, they've actually done correlative studies which show that um, people who have more addictive personalities also tend to um, gain weight more easily. So you could, you know, that's same with gambling, same with drugs, same, same mechanisms exist with food. OK. Um, yeah, sure. All right, real, real quick, one question. You don't think so? All right, we'll skip this question for now. I know we're going a little, we're about halfway through and we have more of the class. All right, so. Treatments, uh, what are things you can do? Well, diet and exercise is obviously the most, con most easiest, uh, least invasive way to actually uh, solve the obesity problem, right? Here's the problem with that. Um, most people are really bad about their diet and exercise. All right, so like there's, here's, the, here's our goals for all these healthy things. We should be eating more of these as a population, and we don't do that. Here's the things we try to limit, meat, poultry, eggs, uh, calories from solid fats and sugars. We don't do that. We're very bad at that as a society. Um, we're also very bad about exercise. So this is a Gallup poll. How often do you exercise, generally speaking? Um, so half the population does exercise more than three days per week. Half the population does not. And this is actually even reflected in, in health measures uh, in, in versus if you break this down by weight, right, BMIs. Overweight people tend to not exercise compared to normal weight and even um, uh, people. Right? So we know the right things to do, change your diet, exercise more. We're just really bad at it. And in fact, here's an interesting study. This is the natural, uh, National Weight Control Registry. This is an American uh, study where they basically ask people who want to lose weight to voluntarily sign up for this study. So these are people who are actively self-selecting to lose weight. They want to lose weight. And their goal is to 
get about seven to ten percent weight loss in the initial year and may keep that off for greater than year, greater than a year. So greater than five percent weight loss maintained for at least one year. Look at the numbers here. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? Okay. Twenty percent managed to get, hit that first year goal. Thank you. Yeah, that was wonderful. Oh, okay. Twenty percent managed to hit that first year goal. Half that half of that population doesn't look, keep that weight off. However, once you get past uh, two to five years, once you get past five years, your odds of maintaining that weight loss are really great. So if you can get past like the first two years of weight loss, your odds of keeping that weight off are actually fairly good. Okay? But think about that. You have a single, per single digit percentage of people who actually want to lose weight actually manage to do it. Right? And this is because it's about a lot, it, you actually have to change your lifestyle. It's actually really hard, right? If you try to do dieting, you have this problem where you diet, your body basically has a famine response, right? Because you're not getting the food, so it's going to starve. It's going to want you to overeat. You, as soon as you fall off, you overeat, and you gain all that weight back. It's this horrible cycle, all right? So what about something like pharma, pharmacological therapy? Okay. Drugs are interesting because think about it. You're, you're affecting your neurological system, your endocrine system, or gastrointestinal system. So there are drugs that can try to cure obesity, but they have horrible side effects in general. And they aren't things that most people want to try. All right? For example, this one has psychosis and addictions, right? and you can die. This one has increased heart attack. So think about it. I'd rather be obese, rather have risk of death because of drugs. So most people, uh, drugs tend not to be um, the way to go because they tend to have global effects on your system. Yes, Shami? It's a, it's a blocker of your, I think it affects your dopamine levels in some way. Right. The problem is also it has horrible other side effects. Right? Mm -hmm. Right, so, yeah, so there's other drugs under investigation, but the problem of, with drugs right now is that they have a lot of side effects. All right? Now, this one I'll talk about in the next one. This is actually a one directly affecting fat absorption in your, in your GI. And this is one that's actually um, manufactured and been on the market for a while. And it's used for um, long-term weight loss. And what it does is really inhibits the lipases that are secreted from your pancreas from actually digesting your fat into some things that are absorbable by your microvilli. So it actually reduces the amount of fat absorbable by your, by your body when you eat. And they've done these, uh, again, these trials where if you take oleostat, you actually lose weight and keep it off much better than if you take a placebo or if you take a oleostat and a placebo afterwards. Right? So this is a drug that you can use to uh, lose weight because it directly affects your gastrointestinal tract. And it has, it has less side effects than something that's affecting your endocrine system or your nervous system. All right? All right. Leptin therapy, though. So this is, uh, as that thought, hey, maybe we can do leptin that will, you know, uh, cure the obesity. It was tried in the 90s, and it just didn't seem to have an effect. Again, the receptors are the problem, not the actual leptin itself. Right? However, they just recently approved it for people who have the leptin-producing defect. Right? If you have this genetic defect, which is very rare, um, that you can't produce leptin, you will tend to overeat like that fat, like that fat uh, mouse did. Right? So if you can supplement those people with leptin, you actually cure that problem. Again does have risks, but it's, it, it's uh, when you, whenever, you, uh, whenever you talk about drugs, it's all about weighing the risks versus the rewards of the, of the therapy. Okay, moving on. What about surgical interventions? Bariatric surgery, right? The concept is obviously you want to limit the amount of food, and you also want to uh, reduce the amount of absorption that the, of, of the food that you did process into your body. Now, this is actually um, a fairly risky thing because you can, there's a lot of side effects. You could die from the surgery, so it's not it's a very drastic measure. So there's NIH guidelines about bariatric surgery. And these are the guidelines that they tell uh, doctors when they advise patients for going, undergoing this. All right? Pretty severe things, right? You have to have a BMI of over 40 that's morbidly obese, right? Or you can have a, a severely obese with one or more associated health problems, things like diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension. Right? And they tell you to do this if everything else fails. Right? So you have to try other things first. Yes, Shmi. Hmm? No, no, no. 
So that's a liposuction, that's different. This is a surgery that actually re physically reduces the space of your stomach. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll go into detail about the, what the different types of bariatric surgery are in a second. So bariatric surgery is something that's increasing. Um, it's really jumped for a, a lot in the last decade. People are using it more and more. And there are really four general types of bariatric surgeries. So this is where you, know, you, you basically cut a portion of your stomach and reroute your, uh, your intestines. So this is called the ruin Y, it's the gold standard. What you do is basically you staple your stomach, right? So partially stomach, stomach, create a smaller pouch so that you will limit the food intake. And then you take the upper portion of your intestine and cut that out and attach that to the stomach, right? So what you're doing is, again, again limiting the size of your stomach. And if you take out this portion, upper portion of your intestine, that's where a lot of your nutrient absorption is happening. So you're reducing nutrient absorption, right? You also have, this is a traditional stomach staple. You're actually just cutting off part of your stomach, right, limiting that. There's the gastric band where you just attach a band, and this is going to actually restrict your amount of food that can go into your stomach, right? This is probably the least invasive. This is the most invasive. You not only do this, right, but then you take the majority of your intestine and bypass that. So you're actually really reducing malabsorption. Okay? And so obviously there's uh, various options if you want to go this route. Uh, you can have minimally invasive or open surgeries. You could have laparoscopic ones, which are kind of done here, or something done robotically. A lot of risk involved, though. Okay? So, but it's fairly effective, though. Okay? Look at the weight loss for one year, three year follow-up. And this is in kilograms, mind you. So it's actually a lot. As you can see, 40-some here, gastrointestinal gastric band, the duodenal switch has the most, but also has the most side effects. Side effects include things like surgical complications, nutritional deficiencies, and possibility of death. So this is not to be taken lightly. Okay? And the reason why uh, ruin Y is considered the gold standard is the best compromise of weight loss versus post-operative effects. That's why, and more and more people are using it, and these techniques are, are being used less and less. Now, you will see a duodenal switch occasionally for somebody who's severely obese, but that's a very extreme condition, uh, very extreme surgery. Bariatric surgery is also really good for resolving um, problems in a person, other health problems, right? So if you have a bariatric surgery, you can really um, solve some, you can solve diabetes, you can cure high blood pressure, you can cure cholesterol, you can clear, uh, cure sleep apnea, and bariatric surgery is actually fairly effective, all right? So this is, remember, um, the percentage total weight loss over a 10-year period with lifestyles and medications. This is your gastric band, so that restrictive thing that's less uh, post-op, uh, has less problems. This is for gastric bypass, the RU and Y. All right, so it's very effective. You lose a ton of weight at the beginning, and you will tend to keep it off in time. This is the average of all the people who've, who've done this surgery over a 10-year period of a study. Right? So obviously, there's lots of variation. But generally speaking, bariatric surgeries tend to be more effective than just lifestyle, lifestyle changes or drugs. Also has uh, impacts on diabetes. And we'll skip this just for time's sake. But generally, if you look at these slides, you uh, compare just medical therapies versus surgical therapies. You have better body max index, better glycemic hemoglobin. Um, this is the before of uh, kind of a poll of people, how people feel in various aspects of their lives pre and post these treatments, and you can see that here. With the gastric bypass, everyone feels better, generally speaking, about their lives. Right, so gastric, bariatric surgery is something that's commonly used, well, it's being more increasingly commonly used, it is not without its risks, but it seems to be very effective, definitely more so than just lifestyle changes or drugs. But again, you don't advise doing it unless everything else has failed, because again, it has the most risk. Questions? Okay. Do we have? I think we have time to do a few of these. Okay. So, I sped through that a little bit. If you want any more questions about um, anything in here in general, feel free to come talk to us at all. Now, I want to just do a few kind of mini case studies on what you guys think. Okay. What would you recommend? Why? All right. Could you clickers out? I want to see. So again, three-year-old male, BMI of this. A lot of other details. What do you think? I 
again, imagine yourself as, as his doctor. What would you advise him at this point, given, given his history? Tell me, Tuck, is, um, actually, I don't know how to describe it. Can you describe it, James? What is it? Oh. Yeah, it's, a, it's a basically a liposuction, and you fold it. Right, so it's a liposuction plus like you, you, you take off the skin and fold it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's it. All right. All right, come on. Any more responses? Thoughts? All right. All right, so right, I'm going to stop it here. And OK. Wow, this is interesting. I like the, so that's an interesting split here. Some people advise ruin why. Some people say you don't recommend the surgery. A lot of people say they don't recommend the surgery. Why don't you recommend the surgery? Can we try anything else? Well, hasn't he had a, hasn't he had a tummy, tummy tuck? That's a good point. Again, there's no right answer here. This is a lot of opinion. Shmi. So again, this is not a right answer here. One thing I will say is um, for the people who selected answer two, um, insurance does actually play a role in this. He's not going to want to do the gastric band because his insurance will not cover it. So something to think about. That's actually something not medically related that is actually going to affect his decision. Right? Yes? Mm. Right. That's a good point. Right. Right. So, so. Yeah, since he's done it before, right? Yeah. Very much so. So that's another reason not to do the gastric ban, right? Because if he already has uh, GERD, he doesn't have good esophageal control. And if you put a banner on there, there might be slippage. And that's a big risk of gastric band surgery. So it's a good reason not to do it. Thank you for pointing that out. Now, for the duodenal switch, that's a tough one, right? That's a, lot, that's a big one. All right, so we'll move on. Uh, next case study real quick. I don't know if I can do this. There we go. OK, same thing, same, same options. What do you think? We can say it's a full year. It's a routine it's between routine physical checkups, right? So if you're if you're uh, of an older age, you want annual checkups if you can. We we'll say yes for the purpose of this question, or she's trying. All right, put in your answers. We can discuss in a second. It's a routine appointment. All right, all right. I'm just going to stop this and see the opinions here. All right, so most people don't recommend surgery, right? That's, she's lost a lot of weight in the last year. 18 pounds is no joke, all right? She's still not great yet, but that's actually pretty good, right? If she's successful in losing this weight and she can continue to do this, I don't, I don't see any reason why to give her a recommend surgery. It's a lot of risk. Yes, Elvis. That's actually a good point, but think about this. In spite of her hypothyroidism, she's lost 18 pounds in the past year. That's probably really excellent, right? So yes, she's probably also taking medicines to treat her hypothyroidism, right? But if she continues to lose weight, that diabetes might go away. Right, the fact that she's 40 years old, I mean, it's not like her metabolism is slowing down tremendously yet, right? So. You know, I, if I were her physician, I would probably not recommend surgery. The other one, the first one was a bit more 
Like you could recommend surgery, you could not. That's definitely something that's a little bit more nebulous. All right, move on. We have some enough time here to cover the case study. Okay, if I can do this. Okay, James. All right. So uh, great job, everyone, with uh, day two in terms of proposing diagnostics and treatments. Um, you guys definitely identified a lot of the things that are less invasive and things that you could do either sooner so that you could get a better sense for what was going on. Um, so a couple of clarifications in some of the responses that I was looking through. Um, something like a CT scan, a, a, a regular CT scan, not like the virtual endoscopy kind of thing that we were talking about in class where you're taking high resolution pictures and then piecing them back together. A regular CT scan doesn't help you so much as far as figuring out where a bleed might be. It could help you in terms of identifying um, if you have a big mass in your abdomen and you're like, oh, that might be cancer. So that can be helpful in that sense. And then barium x-rays are kind of what traditionally was done maybe 20 to 30 years ago. And it's not really invasive in the sense that you're swallowing the contrast dye and then just shooting some x-rays. So it's not actually that big of a deal to do um, a barium contrast study. But I think as everyone identified, the next step was really to do um, some kind of endoscopy, whether the pill capsule kind or the um, push or kind of double balloon enteroscopy to reach the places that you're not able to see um, in the, the standard um, endoscopy that most uh, hospitals have. Oh, that's weird. It's backwards. So anyway, um, so Ms. S, she was sent for capsule endoscopy. And so right now, most uh, insurances and most um, institutions actually don't necessarily have access to this latest technology. And so she was sent for the capsule endoscopy. And it revealed that there was an abnormal collection of veins and arteries toward the end of her small intestine. And that's what's known as a arteriovenous malformation. And so I don't think that was in anyone's differential diagnosis, but that's something that can certainly happen in the GI tract where there's an abnormality in the blood vessels that can um, bleed in one's GI tract. So given this uh, diagnosis, Ms. S is offered the option of undergoing open surgery or um, double balloon enteroscopy to ablate the bleeding. And so she gets it done endos endoscopically. So this is a picture of um, what one might see through the scope. And there are different ways in which, in the endoscope, there are, um, you can stop the bleeding by kind of ablation. So if you've ever seen something cauterized, and what that means is that you, know, you apply heat. And there's different ways of doing that. So in this case, um, they typically use argon gas, which they ignite. And so you don't actually touch the surface of um, the mucosa. And what you do instead is you kind of inject that gas and ignite it. And that provides the heat to ablate it. Other ways that it could be done is using multipolar electrocautery when there's two kind of electrical contacts. And you touch the skin, and that provides an, an electrical circuit, which you can um, deliver electricity and thus heat um, through that to ablate the bleeding. And currently, there are other um, methods that are being investigated. So those are certainly things that you can discuss as far as um, looking at this problem from a bioengineer's perspective. So as far as diagnosis and treatment go, uh, I think the things to, that are pretty interesting in this field are determining how do we treat things emergently, whether it's an acute problem or a chronic problem. For Ms. S, it was kind of subacute as far as it was happening over the span of a few months. But um, she had lost so much blood that she was becoming symptomatic. And so typically, um, the way doctors learn about gastrointestinal bleeding is to classify it, OK, is it happening in the upper GI tract, as in the stomach or the small intestine, or is it in the lower GI tract, as in in the colon. And you can get to both of those places either from the top or from the bottom. But before double balloon enteroscopy, 
there wasn't a great way of accessing that kind of hard to reach middle part. And if you couldn't do it um, endoscopically, you'd either have to do it um, through either open surgery or in certain cases, if the patient is stable enough, you can do laparoscopic surgery. And so there are many causes, as you guys identified on day one. Um, ulcers are very common. Vascular malformations are less common, but still um, something to consider. And cancer is something that you would always want to rule out and make sure that that's not happening. Um, one of the other things that some groups uh, mentioned is angiography. And so what that is, is injecting dye, radio contrast dye, into either the veins or arteries. And that can help show you where the bleeding is occurring. Um, and typically, you access the patient's vessels through the groin. And so you pass these um, devices like a, a wire through the, through the groin. And then that allows you access into the vessels. You inject the dye, and then you shoot the x-ray um, while you're in the catheter lab where they're doing these studies. But this assumes that the bleeding is constant enough that you would actually see this in real time. And that would help you identify where the bleed is occurring. And sometimes you can even, depending on where the bleed is, you can use angiography to also treat things as well. But that's um, not the preferred way of doing things. Um, certainly, if you have a, a bleeding vessel um, in the liver where the, um, where the blood vessels are more directly accessible from the aorta as you go up from the groin, you can use uh, ablation techniques through the vessel as well. So that's one thing to consider. So there's lots of things to um, think about here and then um, kind of propose as far as any aspect of this case, as far as diagnosis to treatment. Um, and definitely, um, so I think after reviewing everyone's kind of proposed diagnostic studies and tests and treatments, um, everyone scored full points. So really great job on that on day two. So we'll be curious to hear what you have for day three.